All right, good afternoon, class. Um, <clears throat> making good on my promise earlier today that I would come back and finish up uh, the lecture discussion that we began earlier today. We we're talking about the importance of the European Enlightenment, and specifically, we're using this idea, this concept of liberalism and what is liberal to sort of help us understand really the essence of the European Enlightenment. And of course, you might be asking the question, uh, oh, what are we doing studying the European Enlightenment and of course on Latin America? And the answer that I gave earlier remains my answer, sticking to it. Uh, and that is that the European Enlightenment was conspicuously absent in Latin America. And it's going to be absent, but it still plays a decisive role because even though Latin America and the powers that be, the authorities that exist in Latin America, are doing their best to limit the spread or the meaning of the European Enlightenment, it doesn't mean that people aren't still adjusting their expectations and um, establishing greater demands uh, from the authorities at work in their society. And by the early 1800s, the, I guess you could say, the dream, the, the deferred dream of the Enlightenment cannot be pushed along anymore. And so finally things start to boil over in Latin America. So today we were talking about uh, essentially what pre-Enlightenment Europe looked like. And we talked about institutions like kings and the church and nobility, uh, superstitions, a fairly antiquated view of the past, scholasticism, which was a mode of intellectual inquiry that had reigned supreme in Europe prior to the Enlightenment, which begins sort of around the mid-17th century, I think of the 1600s, the time of Copernicus, the time of Galileo, Kepler, uh, later on, we'll have people like Francis Bacon. We have um, uh, folks like Isaac Newton. We have, uh, on the uh, social science side of things, folks like John Locke, Adam Smith, so on and so forth. But classical liberalism means, as we talked in class today, liberty from. It's essentially a, uh, a paradigm or a pattern of thinking that allows essentially if you put faith and you put responsibility in the hands of individuals they will not let you down they will come through in fact they will do some of their best work you know one way of making this maybe plain is to say you know if we require little children if we pamper them and wait on them and dote on them and fulfill every single need that they might have they're very quickly going to become a child who is helpless and relies upon other people to do for them. Whereas if we task a child from a very young age with responsibilities and expectations, more often than not, that child will surprise us and will rise to the expectations that we hold them accountable for. Uh, they'll make a pe peanut butter and jelly sandwich for themselves at age four if the alternative is to go hungry. Uh, and so there are ways in which we see this even on an everyday basis uh, in uh, the world around us. Uh, so the assumptions here, individuals are capable, they're good, they can deliver, they will deliver if given the opportunity. And it really does fly in the face of, uh, you know, the previous, the pre-enlightenment thought would be that when people don't work out, when people aren't successful, it's because of something about their you know, maybe there's something based on a superstition or a religious interpretation that they're evil or bad. Um, the classical liberals don't believe this way. They just feel like people who are not performing and not carrying their weight in society, they can be explained by looking at their past and the circumstances out of which they emerged. Okay, pardon me. All right, so... Classical liberalism, what does it believe? So uh, what do classical liberals believe? Well, we talked a little bit about natural law, and this comes to us from John Locke. He believes that uh, really just as much as gravity is a law, 
um, that if you drop something, it will fall to earth. So is it a law that uh, we as individuals have certain rights, and our rights are to life, to liberty, and property. And governments need to recognize and honor this fundamental set of rights that all individuals bring uh, to the world in which they live. And if a government wants to stand in the path and prove to be an obstacle to these natural laws, these natural rights that we all have, then that government is not going to last for long and it's going to be hard pressed to continue and to sustain itself. And of course these are things that our founders believed. And Thomas Jefferson even said, you know, every so often um, the uh, tree of liberty needs to be watered by blood, meaning uh, people if they are going to remain free periodically they're going to have to fight for their freedom. Uh, and by doing so they will uh, be maintaining a very favorable set of circumstances for themselves. So other things, we talked about this yesterday, uncensored press. Press serves as the referee that allows a society to correct itself. So when there are problems that emerge in the social order or the way in which a king or other governmental system is conducting itself, it's the press that will allow for the very, um, the press provides the solution to the problems that exist. Also, the Enlightenment, uh, the classical liberalists, believe that individuals should be free from established religion. You hear that? Freedom from. So this is freedom from the church. Now that doesn't mean that religion is a bad thing per se, or that the church is evil per se. It just means that individuals should not have religion established upon them. Okay, so uh, if I choose to go to church on Sunday, that's great, but a church shouldn't come to me and enforce itself upon me uh, as just part of my membership in society. And that's an important thing, and we have this in our, um, our First Amendment of our Constitution. The first provision of the Bill of Rights, is, it spares us from uh, religion being established for us. We get to choose our religion, not have it chosen for us. Economic freedom is another part of the classical liberalist argument. Some of our classical liberal liberals are the most strong proponents of free trade and we've talked about that already a little bit the mercantilist system is has now crumbled in Latin America and it's being slowly replaced by freer and freer trade even the Bourbon reforms had provisions for freer trade so the Bourbon reforms did have some elements of this uh, enlightenment thinking in it and then also limited government uh, again I'll call your attention to James Madison's famous statement that if all men were angels, we wouldn't need government. Well, men aren't angels, so we need a government that is going to check the excesses of power. If you give a person too much power, they will abuse it. You can count on it just like you can count on the sun rising in the east each morning. So the way you deal with this, according to the Enlightenment and our U.S. Constitution, is an, a document that is a product of the Enlightenment. The way you deal with this is you pit human ambition against human ambition and then you have a limited government that is going to function better because it won't allow one or a small group of people to become too powerful. Their power will be used to be pitted against each other, play off of one another. Okay, so modern liberalism. So most of you are aware that we have this thing called the political spectrum in the way this usually works and um, you can see here that uh, the left side of the political spectrum as this image is trying to show is something that we normally attribute to people who are progressive or liberal minded um, the right side of the spectrum is for people that we normally think of as being conservative if you think about conservatives today and you think about liberals um, in some ways we can almost see evidence of these people based on their habits the way they dress, the foods they eat, the careers they choose, so on and so forth. Generally speaking, conservatives tend to be, uh, I guess in some ways you could say they call a little less attention to themselves. Um, and part of that is just attributable, or it's explained by the fact that conservatives, by definition, tend to have a 
resistance to change. That's an important part of their philosophy. They don't want things to change. And part of this is, is because for a lot of conservatives, the way things currently are, the status quo, kind of serves their needs. It serves them well. And if the way the world is ordered is serving you well, why on earth would you want to change it? Liberals or progressives, on the other hand, tend to want to change things. They see the way the world is ordered and they say, what if it were like this instead? And then they pursue that change. Now, what's interesting is we can explain this, the political spectrum. This is getting back to our question about what is similar about our use of the term liberal way back then and now. Way back then, in the beginning of the Enlightenment, it was liberals who were challenging the status quo. They were striking out away from the powerful institutions like the church, the kings, the nobility, uh, scholasticism. They were trying to make society different in ways that they thought made society better. So way back when, liberals were trying to change things, which is still true today. Liberals have a philosophy by and large that invites change. But what's interesting is conservatives of today will usually anchor their arguments around things that the earliest liberals held true. So that's why we sometimes say the classical liberal position um, is things that modern conservatives feel strongly. It's just that modern conservatives in trying to not change things today or resisting change today are calling attention to changes that were made hundreds of years ago, if that makes sense. So essentially what we have here is a challenge of change that's frozen in time. Liberals of three, four hundred years ago wanted change, and conservatives of today call a lot of attention to the changes, things like a free press, uh, things like economic freedom, things like um, political rights, so on and so forth. These are uh, bulwarks of the modern conservative movement. So this apple cart, I've called attention, I've used sort of an apple theme, and the idea here is, is that if you're a conservative on an apple cart, and you're at the top of that cart, you probably like your position in society. Uh, if you're down low in the cart, underneath all the other apples, you might tend to be a progressive or a liberal because you don't particularly care for your position in that overall apple cart which is being used to demonstrate the social order. So conservatives don't like change because they like their place in the apple cart. Liberals or progressives sometimes invite change often because they don't like their place in the apple cart and we might revisit that later in the course. So the constant here, real quickly I'm going to wrap this up rather fast for those of you who want to know kind of the rest of the story. Well what changes and what serves as a real dividing place for our old concept of liberal and our newer concept of liberal is that starting 150 years ago or so in the United States we had this thing called an industrial revolution. They'd had it 100 years earlier in Great Britain. And as a result of the industrial revolution we watched the emergence of powerful businesses, corporations, companies come into being. And so what this means is a new institution and a very powerful institution will enter into uh, the uh, consciousness of people who live in Western society, and that is big business. So we have big business, which is new, new and newly powerful. And the question becomes, is there another institution that is strong enough to counter the influence of big business? Big business, for a time, was able to accomplish things like monopolies, we had robber barons who became fantastically wealthy, and these big businesses exerted a lot of influence upon the politics and the power structure of society. What that meant was a new generation or a new dawn, a new day for liberals emerged. And so modern liberals tend to be strong supporters of government, and the reason they are is because they feel like government is the only institution that can provide a proper counterweight to the immense power that's concentrated in big business and in corporations. And so even though it might seem quite different for liberals of yesteryear, yester century and today, there is some element of uh, similarity that ties them together or consistency. Thank you. Have a great weekend.